So one of the key messages from Jennifer's speech is that not only does accreditation help grow the economy by keeping pace with change and innovation, it can also save lives. NATA accredits the laboratory tests that assist in the prevention of cervical cancer. Back in 1982, cervical cancer was the sixth most common cancer among Australian women. Now, thanks to our national screening and treatment program and the HPV vaccine, we have among the lowest rates in the world. In fact, Australia is on track to be the first country to eliminate cervical cancer potentially within the next five years. We have with us today two key leaders in this field. Marion Saville is the Executive Director of the Australian Centre for the Prevention of Cervical Cancer. In 2020, she was awarded an Order of Australia for her services to women's health. Professor Karen Canfell is the Director of the, of the Daffodil Centre, a joint venture between the University of Sydney and Cancer Council New South Wales. Her work has been cited by the World Health Organisation as critical in its commitment to eliminate cervical cancer globally. Please join me in welcoming Marion Saville and Professor Karen Canfell. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa and, and to Nata for inviting us to talk about this exciting uh, program of work today. Cervical screening has been an outstanding success in Australian public health to the point where now it's uncommon to know someone who's had this cancer. We started off um, with the pap smear about the same time Nata was developing. Dr George Papanikolaou invented the pap smear and it took several decades to be available in Australia. And you can see there in the 80s, we weren't making much headway despite the availability of pap smears through opportunistic screening. All of that changed in the early 90s uh, when there was an investigation into what was happening and going wrong with screening, which I'll tell you more about shortly. And over the following um, period of time of our organised program, we had significant declines in, in cervical cancer incidents, as you see there. In the early 2000s, we reached the limits of what we could achieve with pap smears, and so we've moved on, as you'll hear, to. Uh, testing for the presence of the virus that causes this cancer, the human papillomavirus. So what did this report uh, from the late 1980s uh, tell us? Well, it identified essentially three major problems. We weren't reaching all the people that were eligible for screening, women in the target age group, and in particular, we were uh, disproportionately reaching well-off women and not women um, who were struggling to get access to these services. There were losses to follow up um, following the, the uh, identification of an abnormality in a pap smear and people with abnormalities weren't getting treated. And then finally and importantly, we had incredibly variable laboratory quality. And as you can see on the right hand side, this was a global problem. There was a landmark article in the Wall Street Journal in the late 1980s about terrible problems with lab quality, with inappropriate incentives and a lack of training. So the features of the organised approach, which then became our national screening program and delivered us these benefits, were that we have active recruitment of our target population undertaken in conjunction with Australian and state and territory governments. We had establishment of our PAP test registers um, around the country that um, followed up people with abnormalities and recalled people for screening. And importantly and relevant today, we had accreditation, um, I've now learnt, um, of our laboratories. Um, and we had really, we always had good laboratories, but we now no longer have poor quality laboratories. So uh, laboratories either improved their services um, or they no longer were reporting pap smears. I'm now going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Professor Karen Canfell. Thank you, Marion. So recently, the World Health Organization has launched a global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer and defined 2030, 10 new goals and targets across three sets of proven interventions. By 2030, 90% of young girls globally will be vaccinated against the human papillomavirus, or HPV. 
By 2030, 70% of adult women will have had access to HPV-based testing for cervical screening a minimum twice in a lifetime. And by 2030, 90% of women that re require treatment for precancer or cervical cancer will be able to receive it. So this has been um, inspired by the example of Australia. Australia was the first country in the world to introduce a national publicly funded HPV vaccination program 15 years ago, back in 2007. And prior to that point, we actually had quite high rates of infections of HPV in young women. So the next slide shows you a graphic showing the age picture of our infections and showing what happened after the introduction of vaccination. You can see this flatlining of infections within the first five years of our vaccination program. And you see on the right uh, current data showing this effect that HPV infections are much rarer than they used to be. But it's all the more important that we detect those infections when they exist because women who carry HPV are at increased risk of developing cervical cancer. That's led to a major transition in our national cervical screening program to HPV testing for primary cervical screening. And it's really important to understand that this is a win-win. HPV screening will reduce cervical cancer incidence and mortality in Australia by a further 20 to 30% but it's actually also very cost effective and not only cost effective, because we can safely increase the routine screening interval with HPV, it's such an accurate test, we can actually move to five yearly screening and that saves um, funds to the National Cervical Screening Program. So again, a win-win economically as well as benefiting women and all people with the cervix in Australia. So this combination of HPV vaccination and the switch to cervical screening Physicians Australia to eliminate cervical cancer. And you can see in this graphic a picture of uh, cervical cancer incidence over time from 2015 through to the end of the century. You'll see this dramatic fall. And in fact, Australia is on track to be the first country to achieve rates of cervical cancer that are so low that it would be considered to be eliminated. We're on track to do that by 2035, or maybe even as soon as 2028, within a few short years from now if we can increase access to HPV-based screening. That's the major driver of this timing. What does this mean on a global stage? Well, um, every woman that loses her life from cervical cancer in Australia is a tragedy. But that's less than one in a thousand of the global lives lost every year from cervical cancer. Hundreds of thousands of, of women uh, develop cervical cancer, mostly in low and middle income countries. And rates are very high in these countries, shown here in this graphic as these red, very high rates, much higher than in Australia. You'll see if we can scale up access to vaccination and cervical screening, that all countries in the world will experience a dramatic fall in rates of cervical cancer to this navy blue or elimination of cervical cancer worldwide. What does this mean for rates of cervical cancer death? Well, if the example in Australia can be duplicated globally, in fact, 62 million women's lives will be saved. And this graphic shows rates of cervical cancer death. On the right, rates will drop if vaccination is rolled out. But if we can add in cervical screening, we'll accelerate this re re result. We could actually re reduce rates of cervical cancer death by one third over the next 10 years, by 92% over the next 50 years, and by 99% over the century. An extraordinary result. So this is the first time ever the world has committed to eliminate a cancer and Australia has been at the forefront of these efforts. We'll now go to a short film that'll show us how Australia is positioned to eliminate cervical cancer. Thank you. If you had the opportunity to eliminate a cancer, why wouldn't you take that opportunity? Especially with a cancer that is responsible for so much death, disease and suffering worldwide. In Victoria, we've been active participants in screening programs to ensure that cancers are detected earlier in take-up of vaccination programs as well. And so we've seen as a result of that, Victoria achieve the lowest levels of cervical cancer in Australia. 
Victoria is approaching what will be possibly elimination targets with a mortality of about one per 100,000, which is absolutely world leading. And what that tells you is that with the right systems and processes, you can achieve very good control of cervical cancer. It puts within our grasp the possibility of eliminating cervical cancer as a public health issue. Thank you, Karen and Marion. It's not every day you get to sit down with people who are actually curing cancer. Um, tell me, first of all, Marion, could you explain the difference between eradication and elimination? Or so, whoever wants to answer Karen, that. Sorry, take that. Karen. I'll take this one. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's really important to make this distinction. We talk about eradication of a virus. So over the long term, vaccination will in fact eradicate, we hope, the human papilloma virus. But of course, many adult women, as we saw, have already been exposed to HPV and therefore are at risk of cervical cancer. So there's a new concept called elimination, which means that cervical cancer rates can be dramatically reduced very quickly to rates where it's considered to be controlled. It's a very, it becomes a very rare, rare cancer in that situation. And really the key to doing that is to offer HPV-based screening to as many women as possible. So why is it that accreditation is so important in this screening and testing process? So um, obviously the quality of the tests we do are critical. When we say that a pap test or now an HPV test is negative, we're saying that there's no cause for concern and you could go away for previously two years, now five years. So obviously a false negative test result in that would be falsely reassuring. So it's critical that those results are accurate. So self-collection has been life-changing for some women, and I believe that as of July 1, that will be rolled out to everyone. Um, we're going to look at a video now that shows, it talks about Claire's story, and this has literally been life-saving for her. So let's look at that video now. My name's Claire, I'm 42, I live in Melbourne, and this is my wife, George. And yeah, I did the self-collect test, and that's how I found out that I had cervical cancer. Back sort of 20 years ago, doctors were kind of like, if you identified as LGBTIQ+, that you didn't need to get those tests because um, it wasn't so much of a risk for you to have cervical cancer. It had probably been 10 to maybe 13 years since I'd had a test previously. I think, you know, at that point in time, I just kind of did it to stop my doctor from badgering me. From that point, things happened very quickly. Um, the next thing was that I got a letter from the Mercy, the hospital, women's hospital in Melbourne, asking me to come and do further screening. And from then, um, pretty much on first look, the oncologist was like, he knew it was cancer straight away. You know, at that point in time, he was like, the best outcome is that you will have a radical hysterectomy. Hearing that at the time, that's pretty intense um, information. I had a radical hysterectomy, therefore didn't have to have any chemo, which was amazing. Um, it was a really good, clean surgery. Straight after surgery, maybe two days later, I found out that I was completely cancer-free. That was the best outcome that could have happened. So the self-collect test you can just do in the privacy of the cubicle at a doctor's office is how I did it, um, rather than doing it with the doctor. And I think that it was um, less invasive, n not painful, less kind of being exposed. Um, yeah, so I think it was just, a, it was easier to do go to a doctor that will offer you that as a test because for me it was the difference well to be dramatic is the difference between life and death like it's better to go and get that test than no test um, and I think that I am kind of proof that why that test is really important. Thank you for that and tell me what has been the government's role in supporting this program? So Australian governments, both the Commonwealth and the state and territory governments, have supported the National Cervical Screening Program really since its inception um, back in the early 1990s, um, supported evidence-based changes such as the change to HPV screening, and most recently supported this change to make self-collection available not only to those who are 
overdue for screening, but anyone who's due for screening. And as you saw in Claire's story, um, it's really important that we get those people in. Um, the people we're not reaching are the people that we want to hear from. Um, we're developing Australia's plan to eliminate cervical cancer on behalf of the Commonwealth Government, and people can participate um, by going to this website. Whether you're someone who's had an experience of your children being vaccinated, of screening, good or bad, or indeed of cancer treatment. We really want to hear from you about how we can make things better. So people can take part in an online survey, survey. right. Mm -hmm. And how else can they get involved in this program? So also you've seen some clips from Conquering Cancer um, and you can host a screening of a documentary length movie and you can use it to raise funds for your chosen, uh, chosen group. I think we've got a trailer for that. Should we have indeed. a look at that now? When I know that I have this sickness, I just terrify. So to me, that word cancer was automatically death. I almost didn't engage with it for a while. I couldn't be a cancer patient at 26. You don't want to see anybody dying unnecessarily, but seeing young women dying when they've got young kids, that's something you really have to do something about. Cervical cancer is the most common cancer that we have in Zambia. Cervical cancer is one of the only cancers that we've totally figured out. And so really no woman should be dying of cervical cancer. For us to talk about elimination, we're talking about women getting screened, and we're talking about HPV vaccination. What Zambia has done basically shows that it can be done by any of the low-income countries. In a generation, we could be in a fundamentally different place than we are right now. There is a concerted international effort from everyone. It's the sound of many voices speaking the same message. When we have all the weapons at hand, a failure should not be an option. Conquering cancer means a world with women who are empowered to do other things. If there is a chance for me, I will keep on fighting. I will just keep on fighting, yeah. We have to take this opportunity, we have to take this moment in history. The ability to conquer cancer is so powerful. Do I think we should be talking elimination every place in the world? Yeah, I do. And the question is, how is the world going to step up to meet that need? Um, what, what's Australia's role been in this, um, in this quest to eliminate cervical cancer on an international stage? I think Australia has played a leading role in many different ways. I think people here will probably be aware of the important role of Professor Ian Fraser at the University of Queensland and his collaborator, Dr Jan Zell, who developed the HPV vaccine and, and had critical innovations in vaccine, vaccine technology. But it's also been Australia's leading example in the public health space, so that early rollout of HPV vaccines and then that critical world-leading uh, switch to HPV screening in 2017. We were one of two countries to do it and to lead the way in 2017, along with the Netherlands. So I think it's our public health example, as well as the vaccine development. And then thirdly, it's really been the research agenda that the Australian government has supported a network of researchers really to, to further develop, to iterate on these improvements. And this has really helped inform the global strategy from the World Health Organization. So when can we expect uh, to see the elimination of cervical cancer internationally? So as we've heard, in Australia it's quite an imminent prospect and other high-income countries have the prospect of following suit if they also transition to HPV screening. That is a critical enabler and, um, and facilitator of that rapid elimination. For low- and middle-income countries, it will take longer just because those countries currently have a very high burden of disease. It may take many decades in some countries with the highest burden. 
But I think the most important point that we're trying to emphasise is if, if we can scale up across those three pillars you heard about, vaccination, HPV screening and access to treatment, there are millions of lives to be saved along the way. And in fact, screen and treatment by itself will save 14 million lives in the next few decades. So that's the key message. Yeah. So just to reiterate that then, you know, how now that we've seen the impact on people's lives, what is your key message to the audience to take away from this today? Well, I think the key message is get your kids vaccinated. Um, they should have a consent form in the first term of year seven as they start school. That should be a rite of passage. And if you're sitting there thinking you're overdue for screening, perhaps make an appointment to see your GP from, from sorry, July 1st because you could access self-collection if that speculum exam has been putting you off. Thank you. You actually have reminded me I need to book in for a test. Thank you. It's well overdue. We, we will take a 10-minute break now, and when we come back, we'll discover how NATA and NAB are working together to beat cybercrime, and we'll discuss how new standards are keeping up to date with emerging technologies in the world of AI, blockchain, and smart cities. Don't forget you can join the conversation by following NATA on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or you can ask a question using the chat function. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes.